So today we're in sunny Canterbury at Fears Watches. <laughs> And today we are joined with uh, Mr. Nicholas Bowman Scarville of uh, Fears Watches. Thank you for joining us, mate. Oh, uh, thank you for making the road trip down and bringing the beautiful weather today. I know, we try to, we try to. <laughs> Absolute <laughs> pleasure. He's exactly. a fantastic drive as well. It's actually quite nice to have someone on the uh, show that's not a dog. Yeah. <laughs> I'm that's, disappointed. Uh, <laughs> I, I, all, I got the dog biscuits out. I was all ready for. Is that what I've been eating? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Don't start barking in the video, Luke, you'll ruin it. <laughs> so first things first, as per usual, um, let's all do a wristwatch check whilst we're here. So, um, Nicholas, as you're the guest, what are you wearing today? I'm wearing my personal Fears Brunswick, which I wear pretty much every day. Um, but it's my actual watch that I bought from the company and it means that I get to wear it and knock it around and not worry too much about Fabulous. it, which I absolutely love. Um, yeah, I was really expecting the Daniel Wellington to come out actually. Yeah. Today, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fantastic choice. What about you, Luke? I've got on, of course, got the Speedmaster on. Yeah, it's summer, so it's on a NATO now. So I yeah. like this NATO one. It's Adrian's, is gas. it? Yeah, oh, it's I from the Adrian's. Adrian's. So the re they're really well made, and it has a. I love the square holes as well. I oh, know, they're good. really good. No, really well made. No impressed, really impressed. And you? Um, I thought as we were going to be looking at some vintage watches and some vintage inspired watches today, I wear my 1966 uh, Rolex Turnograph, um, which I absolutely love. So as I said before, we're in Canterbury, sunny Canterbury today, uh, at the Fears showroom. Um, Nick Fears, so am I right in thinking they are the oldest UK watch manufacturer, or one of the oldest? One of the oldest. It's I'd love to be able to say it's <laughs> the oldest. Um, there are there are some brands that have been resurrected that are slightly older. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, I get on very well with the owners of them, but it is, yeah, so one of the oldest, but I would say Fears has a very, it has what I call a very clean history, you know. It started in 1846, it closed 130 years later in 1976. There's like a direct link, and then it closed 40 years, and then restarted. So, yes, it may not be the oldest, but it's certainly, well, it's 173 it's years incredible. old. Yeah, it's, it's, I always find it funny when you look at quite a, bit, a lot of the big Swiss brands and you're like, oh, you were founded in 1884. Oh, great. Well, yeah, I mean, by that point, we were already on our second managing director, you know. <laughs> and you're the, you're the fourth managing director. Yeah, so which, it doesn't mean there's four. We, we didn't get the first one. We had no, to sell no, it for you. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> one, two, and three. Too busy to see you guys today. Yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, so, yeah, I'm the fourth person to be a managing director of Fears. So the previous three were my relatives. So the first was Edwin Fear, who started the business. Then his son, who took over, he was the second. And then when his son took over, who was my great-grandfather, he was the third. So it's sort of a way of linking it and kind of linking us all together. Mm -hmm. So I'm the great-great-great-grandson of Edwin Fear, which makes me the sixth generation. But yeah, because we missed out two generations in 40 years, Makes me the fourth, not the sixth. <laughs> and were you were you always into watches yourself? Has it always been like a Pretty lifelong? Much. Okay, well, so I started with a Timex. Yeah. I don't remember the exact age. I would have been single digit age, so mm -hmm. like five, six, seven, something like that. Uh, I got a little Timex on a blue strap, which meant it was the quartz Timex. The red strap meant it was a manual wind. But back in the early 90s, you wanted the quartz one. Quartz like, that was the one in the playground that had the, you know, the kudos. <laughs> that was the cool watch, you know. The red strap guys, it's like, you went for the cheaper manual and mechanical. <laughs> oh, how we look back. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. um, so I started with that, and then when I was 10, I picked out my first ever watch, which was a Casio. Not the Casio that I won't <laughs> mention it by name. Thank God. Um, <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that bloody Casio. There is. No, there anyway. is. <laughs> I, actually, I've never owned a digital watch. I can't read digital time. The mm. only, if I look at a digital time, in my brain, 
I have to, I then take the first number and I put it on an imaginary watch dial and then I take the second number, which is the minutes, and put that and then I see the shape and then I know the time. <laughs> That's when you know you're too ingrained into the watch world. I, and I don't know if it's because I'm dyslexic or whether I'm, I'm, I don't have a photographic memory but I have a almost photographic yeah. memory. So I'm, I'm much more a visual person. So mm -hmm. I will remember shapes and things. And so for me, time is shape. It's not numbers. Yeah. Um, in my head, that's your excuse for buying the old Rolls Royce thing, where it doesn't have a digital clock. No, it's exactly. Got it's, it's got, got an analog clock <laughs> inside. We need to get the Rolls Royce. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we want a Fiesta. No, we're going no, to no, we can't have that. No, no digital. No digital. <laughs> and I think when I was 13, I then bought a, I bought an Accurist. Okay. I bought a, what would now be described just as a tank, but you know, it was a rectangular Accurist in gold, not real gold, like, not even PVD, I don't think they'd invented PVD. You know? <laughs> uh, this is a plating, black dial, just batten, batten numerals, uh, indices and, and hands on a gold bracelet. And I'm, on reflection, I looked at it and it was, at the time, it was an old man's watch. But I loved it because I remember at 13 seeing an advert for a Reverso. Okay. <clears throat> and at the time, I was very into like Jeeves and Worcester, Poirot, you know, that sort of art deco period. And I remember just being and a rectangular watch is just so cool. Yeah. Uh, cool, in inverted commas, you know. Uh, <laughs> Kids know nothing. Kids know nothing. <laughs> no, no, no. I wasn't bullied that much at school. <laughs> I was just having the art deco, was at school. Like, <laughs> 13, I was, what was I doing? It's because you're, yeah. you're a heathen, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then when I was about 15, I discovered, what did I got? I'd just say cheap watches, like nice cheap watches. like. It was at the time when I would go, my clothes were all from Burton, Topman, Next, River Island, and they were doing watches. Okay. And the watches they did were branded like Next or River Island. And they were actually all right. And I remember buying a watch, 15 pounds, which you look at it now and it was a complete rip off of a Panerai. <laughs> I remember the big day when my dad lent me his Tissot, mm -hmm. a quartz Tissot. And this watch was, I think, £120 brand new. And I was just like, £120 for what? <laughs> like, what? You know, and I loved this t shirt. I would, I'd go to school and I'd like this. Swiss made. Swiss made. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I knew about Rolex. I knew about all the big brands at this point. You know, I was the sort of guy who at 15 would go into any, I'd go into all the watch dealers and I'd be like, oh, can I try on that? that day date and they'd look at me and I'd be like my godfather says he's going to buy me a lovely watch for my 16th and I'd just play up the like <laughs> I've got this rich godfather and he'll buy me a lovely watch so please let me try on these watches and suddenly and it was interesting because they would be like yeah okay of course and then you get to 19 and it's still the same story they think, oh, same story. Their godfather exists. <laughs> yeah. I think he's been suffered in the recession you know <laughs> well, I suppose how many 15 year olds I mean, when I was 15, I certainly wasn't going into ADs looking at watches. I mean, I, I wish I was. Dagged them. <laughs> I was doing a lot worse things than that. But I imagine that they don't see that very no, often. No, and so. it also helped that at 15, I looked older, you know. Mm -hmm. um, stuff. So I knew about this watch, but I also knew that like, I would never own or wear these watches because mm -hmm. like, no one owns and wears a Rolex because they're just, they're Rolex. You know? I suppose it's like, before I was really into watches and when I was younger, so everyone's aware of Rolex and it was just so far beyond kind of my reach that you don't really give it a second thought. You kind of, oh yeah, it's, it's nice. Put it this way, if I see someone wearing a Rolex today, I've worked for the company, I've owned several Rolexes. It can be any Rolex and I'll still be like, oh, they're wearing, oh they must be pretty well off. Like, and yeah. I know that you can buy, you know, a pre-owned or second hand for, okay, we're saying not that much money. Yeah. I, it's all relative. It's relative. But, but I'm saying like, you know, if you had a grand, you, there will be a Rolex that you could buy. You know, if you go on Krona24, you can search for Rolex, any Rolex. Which is still you, a ludicrous amount of money when you think about it, it for a, it's essentially a clothing accessory. Um, True. And if you're not interested, which in we don't need, exactly, and we don't need, need to own and wear these things, exactly, because so, our phones to it. So it's, like, it's so it's really weird. Like now I'm like well down the rabbit hole of watches. Now when we're talking like four or five grand for a watch, I'm like, oh yeah, it's pretty reasonable. It's not too well, bad. Is, right. Whereas literally six months ago, the thought of spending more than a thousand pound on a yeah. watch was like, no, no, why would I do this? And this is the exact thing. And 
you know, so I'm trying on these watches, but I'm wearing this 120 pound borrowed T-shirt. I'm like, look at this, this is amazing. Um, and then, and I've actually got it here, I'll show it to you. I then in 2004 got the Ernest Jones watch collection. And it's fascinating because, you know, a mechanical tag Heuer was like 800 pounds, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's the prices are just so different from today's prices. And I remember looking at this and I was like, I really want that tag Heuer. I started researching it, like, and then I was also, this is early days internet. I would send letter, I'd write a letter to say Rolex in the UK or Amiga and say, I would like a copy of your printed brochure. And they would send me a parcel with a copy of their printed brochure. Um, so I've got the Amiga catalog from 2005 and it is, it's incredible what they've got in there. And I find this Amiga Seamaster GMT with a white dial. And I was just like, that is incredible. Mm -hmm. And it, I, it was a toss up between, was I going to dream about that or the watch you've got, the Explorer 2. Ah, yeah. With the polar white dial, and, I was, and because they're very similar. The spec was very, very similar. And the difference in price between them was, I think the Explorer 2 was like 1750, and the Amiga was 1330, you know, which of course, to me, was just like, well, the Ro Rolex is way too expensive. Mm -hmm. But I, I spent two years saving my weekend job money birthday money like any pennies I could get all the money and I had a separate savings account called Amiga <laughs> and everything just went into this account and then I remember just for my 18th birthday having enough money to go into the AD and buy the watch and it was incredible like and just the experience of buying the watch and like mm -hmm. so did you still have that or no I sold that watch and the crazy thing is when I sold that watch a few years ago I made a huge loss on it, but I didn't, you know, I, I didn't buy it for, as an investment. I bought it no. to wear it, and the fact that I got anything near the retail price back was great. So that that went quite early on. Um, I bought a ball watch. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really nice watch. I bought that. Really I, underrated watch, is that? Really underrated. And the quality is outstanding, and I sold that at the same time as I sold the Amiga. Again, I made a huge loss on it, but I got anything back was great. Um, I had, I, the, uh, so yeah, if you can imagine up until this point, I'd had like 20 or 30 watches and then suddenly it was like the Amiga, nothing else gets worn. Then I got the ball as my sort of dress watch and I sometimes wore that. And then when I started working at Rolex, I bought a Rolex. Yeah. I bought a second hand Rolex. I bought a 1959 manual wind oyster date. Nice. Ooh, wow. Silver dial, like so under the radar, 34 millimeter oyster bracelet. Amazing. And I paid 800 quid for it or something. And it was in it was in good condition, lovely watch. And I wore that pretty much every day yeah. working at Rolex. It was Rolex. an everyday wearer. Exactly. I didn't actually sell that. I got it serviced and got my dad's initials engraved and gave it to him for his 60th birthday. But I, when I gave it to him, it was because I was buying my absolute dream watch, my grail watch. I'd been saving up because I knew what I wanted to buy. Mm -hmm. A white gold day date. But smooth bezel, so it looked a bit okay. like a platinum one. Yeah. White baton dial. Ooh, yes. The ultimate stealth wealth it watch. Is, yeah, you know? And the only reason I could afford to buy it was because I got a rather good discount on it as a brand new watch. Um, and it was my dream watch. I'm never going to sell it. You know, I was going to wear this, and I wore it every day. Like mm -hmm. I was like, yes, I know it's an 18 karat white gold watch. It weighs like 150 grams. You know, it's like wearing an iPhone on your wrist. But if you're spending time. that money, you're like, I will damn well I'm wear going it. To wear it. You know, and <laughs> for me, I love the sort of juxtaposition of like on a Sunday going to the pub, and I'm in my ripped Levi's that I've had since uni. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a rugby shirt I've had from school, and then I've got my white gold day date and my Hermes belt on. Mm -hmm. And it still goes. <laughs> and it's that thing where no one's gonna, but for me, I love the fact that I'm wearing like, you know, I, I love that sort of being able to wear something in, which is fabulous in a very casual setting. Yeah, absolutely. Because for me, it's like, yes, I'm careful with my possessions, but it is a watch, you've got to enjoy it. Like, yeah, you know, 100%. you can't be precious about it. Um, and I was going to keep that watch. Uh, I wasn't going to sell it. I budgeted that Fears was going to be fine without it. Um, and then, if you bear in mind, I left Rolex start of 2016. Mm -hmm. I set a date, I was going to launch at Salon QP at the end of 2016. 
everything's budgeted, place all the orders, I started designing watches at that point, you know, everything's happening. And then something happened in June 2016 that rather threw a spanner in the works because overnight the exchange rate changed. Yeah. And I had to find eight and a half grand immediately. Oh. And I spent, I, I had a startup budget which was my husband and my savings. You know, we, we had sold anything that wasn't screwed to the ground in our house. You know, everything had gone. <laughs> the watches had gone. You know, we were down to going like, you know, do we need this teacup? I'll put it on eBay for 10 quid. You know, everything had gone. That's right. So suddenly we we're like, well, what do we do? And it was just like, the Rolex, it's gotta mm -hmm. go. So I literally was going around all the watch dealers going, I know the market has now completely crashed, but like, I need cash like today for this. What will you give me? And it was oh. the most awful experience. But right. it's interesting. I didn't think about it for a second. No. Like there was no... It's nowadays when I'm going to watch events and people have got their collection of the Rolex, you know. <laughs> but actually, it's probably the Amiga I wish I'd held on to because the Amiga was the when I was 18. That's your first. I wore it for university. I wore it on my wedding day. You know, it's got all that sentimental value. But it's the... And the Rolex, I don't miss in that regard. I miss it because it was my, my grail yeah. watch. Um, but it's funny, yeah. I did not, and I lost so much money on that. You've converted one care. dream to this dream that's right. continuing to go. So you're saying, like, I'm wearing the Fears today. You know, this watch is worth so much of more than that is. watch. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is worth so much more because of what it represents. Before you actually started Fears, you was in the watch world anyway, so. Yeah, so. I, when I started Fears, I just finished doing, working for Rolex mm -hmm. for five years. Um, I wanted to do a career change in my early 20s and sort of mm -hmm. did that thing where you go back to going like, if I was a seven year old and was like, I could be anything in the world, what would I be? <laughs> and I, I decided on two careers, train driver or watchmaker. Which mm -hmm. trains and watches are my two passions. Well, I saw the train up there, right? You saw the model yeah, train. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I haven't looked at it before. Yeah. And, I was like, right, actually watchmaking really excites me. You know, I like the idea of being in a workshop, working on something so small, you know, it's it's a craft as well as, you know, Absolutely. something I'm passionate in. And so I wrote to all the big watch companies in the UK and said, I want to I want to work for you. I'd love to, you know, change from my existing job in public relations. And I, I, I wrote to everyone in, in the UK and after seven months of interviews and practical assessments, Rolex <laughs> took me on. As an apprentice, um, and it was very, it was very strange because they they liked the fact that I'd done design technology at school, so I was able to show them some of the the items I'd made and machined. So it showed that I kind of, I wasn't a complete, you know. Should have brought the Casio. I know exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I, I there I remember my Casio, but it showed that I, I, you know, I knew what I was doing with my hands. Yeah. Um, but they also liked the fact that I hadn't got any watchmaking experience because yeah. then you've learned bad, yeah, bad traits, you know. If I'd been a self-taught or I'd worked somewhere else, that's great, but you've got to like unteach it because you want to be taught the Rolex way. Yeah. Obviously there's a lot of theory, which is the same, mm -hmm. but there's a, a way of doing things, you know, the Rolex yeah, way. Yeah, I imagine. I mean, well, the they, they have a section on their website called the Rolex way. Well, <laughs> but it's all the little things like how you hold a screwdriver, yeah. like how you do it with the pressure and like wearing a loop and like, you know, there's all these little things which yes, over time you do, you know how's the best way. Mm -hmm, yeah. Or a pen, you know, if you want to teach someone how to write nicely, you kind of want them to almost have never written in their life. Yeah. Never got into those weird quirks and you know, doing a heart instead of a dot on an eye, you know, those sort of things. <laughs> and did you, you used to mark you. his no, I was gonna say, you used to mark his homework, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting because when you first arrive you sort of you watch people handling watches and no one's rough with watches. But everyone's very confident, you know. Yeah. You pick up a watch and just like pick it up, look at it, you know. And I'm like, oh, you can never do that because I've only held Rolexes in showrooms before, sure. you know, where yeah. it's a brand new watch, or someone gives it to you at a dinner party, or and you're like, oh, it's your watch, you know. Get your white gloves on. Yeah, exactly. It's all, you know, very <laughs> precious. And very quickly, you're just like, this is just a watch. And whether it's a, an Air King or a platinum gem set, day day. It's still a Rolex, mm -hmm. it's still a watch. And it was fascinating how quickly you get into that. And so I always find it funny when I'm showing the Fears collection to people and everyone will pick it up and I'm like, no, 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 just put it on. Like, yeah, yeah. chill out. <laughs> like, the worst that will happen is you'll drop it and it will have to go to the workshop. But like, 
actually that's not the end of the world like you know just enjoy and relax with it because you haven't met me you like you, we haven't spent yeah, yeah, we, haven't, haven't, yeah. we haven't spent a long enough time if i'm holding onto the watch there's a good chance that i could drop it through something <laughs> it would be oh it's going even, out the window yeah. through down, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. i'm just gonna hold it in the sunlight and by it goes out into the car you might as well give it to someone that's got hammers for hands yeah, exactly yeah. yes uh, i am a ham-fisted buffoon and i make no bones about it <laughs> as well as at rolex i was enjoying the job but i did realize that there was going to be this was what I was going to be doing in the next 40 years. Yeah, you know, yeah, I was yeah. going to be sat at that exact work bench. You'd enjoy it, but you feel like you stagnate a little bit, I guess. Or yeah. I don't and know I, stagnate's the right word for it there, but... It's that thing where you're like, actually, I've not always wanted to be like, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. and I want, But I've always had that, like, I kind of want to do more tomorrow than I did today. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, Which is the part of human satisfaction. You, yeah. you need to better yourself constantly. I mean, I don't, I don't have like a personal slogan or mantra I live by, but it's always like, you, I always aim that tomorrow will be better than today. Not saying today's bad, but like, I want tomorrow to be more. Yeah. Um, and it's just, you, you want to develop more, you want to, you know, as a person and like, and, and for me, I kind of suddenly realized that actually 40 years of doing the same thing, I just didn't think I was going to really love that. I like to I like to plan everything in advance. I don't want to have to make last minute decisions. Mm -hmm. But I can't count the number of times I've been walking onto a plane to go on a five hour flight and I'm having to make a decision that not only will cost me, you know, tens of thousands of pounds, but will have a huge impact on how things will be in the future. You know, yeah. we're talking about like design of boxes and things, and suddenly it's like do you want it to be this finish or that finish? And you're thinking, why, why, why didn't we think about this before? But of course, you know, when when you run a business and like myself, you know, it is just me. Yeah, you are having to keep so many different balls in the air, plates spinning. That of course, I, I like that. It's exciting. Yeah, you know, it, it fires you up in the morning. And and some of those last minute decisions is it's generally not with your head. It's with your heart. Um, so I think sometimes it comes out better like that. So if you are making that decision kind of off the cuff, that's what you're naturally thinking anyway. And Definitely. you can see it's paid off some of the stuff you share us already today. It's none of it seems like it's a rushed, hasty decision that you're going to regret. Everything seems fantastic there for a I've reason. I've got um, locked in my safe. I've got a little red book and it's my book of sort of woes. And it's basically a page is dedicated to everything where I know that I've screwed up since mm -hmm. I started Fears. And it's, it, you know, it's not a safe big enough if I was right. <laughs> <for that. laughs> but someone said to me, they were like, that's really depressing. Why, why would you want to be reminded? And you're like, look, at the beginning, if you make a mistake and it maybe costs you 500 quid, that's the biggest amount of money in the world. But it's 500 quid. Later on, mistakes can, you know, mm -hmm. as a business grows, a mistake could cost a lot more and it could potentially bring a business down. So you're like, actually, it's good to remind yourself of, what you've done wrong in the past so that you won't do it again, you know, in the future. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm going home and like beating myself up going, oh, I wish I'd done this different. But there are things where you go, yeah, you know, we're learning this. Like this is, I haven't run a business before. So, you know, the last two and a half years, there are a lot of things that I've been learning as we've been going along, mm -hmm. you know, learning about different sort of rules and regulations, learning how things are done, the best way to do things. Yeah, and so, you do learn from your mistakes. That's how yeah, learns, exactly. Yeah. I know you mentioned as well, you, you've relaunched Fears after, what, 40 years, right? So yeah. It's been 26... 2016, 2016, yes. On its, what would have been its 170th anniversary. So. so you had, so you were, you were watchmaking at Rolex. Yeah, was so you, I, I didn't finish my apprenticeship. I was sort of sure. like a sort of watchmaker's technician. So I was doing like parts of servicing. And, and also if you brought your watch into the headquarters in St. James's Square and wanted say a bezel insert change, I would probably be the guy to come out and do that while you waited, you know? <laughs> okay. So they call it quick service. So it's like, all, you know, how many jobs can you do while someone waits? And <laughs> so how many years does it actually take to become uh, like a Rolex watch master? Uh, what, watch master? Watch, watch master. <laughs> watch master. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how many years does it take to complete your apprenticeship? Well, it sort of varies person to person, you know, what, what previous experience they've got, but usually you're sort of in that sort of five, seven years but really, wow. you're, you're never... That's like doctor. Oh, yeah, yeah. doctor, <laughs> architect. You know. But you've never, you never know at all, you know. No. Even the master watchmaker who's been doing this 40, 50 years, they're still learning stuff. Like, and also, there's new models coming out. There's new of course, yeah. you know, 
something like the Sky Dweller is so different from everything before it, you know, and then you suddenly go, oh, well, most Rolex, modern Rolexes use a free one, free five movement. Oh, but now we've got the free two, free five. Well, that's a different architecture. That's a different movement. It's, it's learning all again. Exactly. Learning. Was there a catalyst moment for you? I know you, you said that you didn't want to um, just spend 40 years. Doing yeah. Was there a catalyst that made you thought, right, I'm going to relaunch Fears? Was there anything that, a eureka moment, if you will? Yeah, there, there, there is very much. And I'm, unfortunately, I don't know the exact date. Because <laughs> it's sort of that thing, it'll, it'll have to be written into the archive. Like, you know, around this period, there was, so what basically, was happening. I knew I'd had relatives who'd been watchmakers. Sure. What I'd never been told and explained to me fully is how they were also managing directors as well as watchmakers. And what, what I mean by that is, so I was back home with my family for Sunday lunch and chatting away saying, look, I'm enjoying my job. I know I've already made a big career change from PR to, to, to watchmaker, but actually, I kind of feel like I want to do something different. I'd, I'd like to maybe work for myself, but I don't really know what I want to do. I'm not sure. that sort of, whenever I've been referred to as an entrepreneur, I'm always like, well, I'm not that entrepreneur who like looks for a gap in the market and comes up with the idea. <laughs> and I, I, look, I admire people who can do that, but for mm -hmm. me, I'm not that and sort You're not of, the Instagram entrepreneur sitting yeah. there on the bones of your ass with a pot noodle in your hand, posting pictures on Instagram. Yeah, like it's sort of <laughs> that's that. what we do. Yeah, <laughs> that's literally what we do. It's what we're doing now. Yeah, true. Hashtag <laughs> entrepreneur life, you know. <laughs> but um, but I knew. But I was like, I would, I'd be interested in doing something, you know. Yeah. Um, and my mum sort of half jokingly goes, well, why don't you restart the family watch business? <laughs> so, right. you, so you didn't know about fears at this point? Or? So I kind of think back and that people had mentioned watches and Bristol and they're watchmakers, and, but I'd kind of always assumed they were like the guy at Timpson's, you know, the sort of the, the one man, the, the lone watchmaker. <laughs> the guy at Timpson's with a, with a tag on. <laughs> just doing battery watching, uh, watch yeah. changes. Just you know, the, the, the sort of the yeah. independent, just doing sure. your repairs and stuff. And I hadn't realised that actually, you know, they'd been they'd set up and run this business. That you know, in the thirties, it was the west of England's largest watch manufacturer. It was actually making watches for longer than Smiths, which is set up before Smiths, which closed is closed after. And know. everybody knows Smiths as yeah. well, which is. It's weird. Obviously, I hadn't known about fears until I met you, and then obviously absolutely fascinated by the history. And it's it's one question that's been bugging me: is why is fears not as well known as Smiths? So even before I was into watches, I knew Smiths. Yeah, but didn't know fears, which just seems. I guess like saying there was a lot of them Swiss made Swiss brands as well, though. Oh, they were really, course. really huge before yeah. the quartz crisis. But also, fears didn't do military watches. I mean, yeah. recently we've started finding unearthing photographs of the old showroom mm -hmm. from the 20s and 30s. Very and cool. I actually got the other day an old watch box from the 30s. And what they'd stamped, one of the sort of slogans that Fears had at the time was watchmaker to the Admiralty. Never knew that. No. Wow. <laughs> Suddenly it's like there's this whole part of the Fears heritage that I don't know. And because there was no archive, I've rebuilt the Fears archive from scratch because either everything got destroyed in the Bristol Blitz in the 40s, all the premises took direct hits and were blown up, oh, so wow. all the records were destroyed, or when the business closed in the 70s, nowadays if you close something, you would give it to an archive or you'd give it to the library. Or the, no, no, back then you close a business, well the business is now closed, so we'll just literally burn the paperwork, we'll give away the old watches. You know, we'll Which just, is upsetting in a way, but then you get to go on this massive adventure where right. you're dealt with the rabbit finding holes, the yeah. rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, when, you know, at this point, at that point where I'm first told about fears, I know this much. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time I left Rolex, I probably knew this much. I now know, well, your camera isn't wide enough. Yeah, I, I now know this much. <laughs> yeah. you know. And it, get a better angle. Get a better lens. <laughs> Super wide angle yeah. to you know, capture the. And it's incredible because, you know, a number of people coming forward with, you know, mm -hmm. either donations to the archive or new information. So, for example, I we've got a watch which is just here, which uh, was made in 1868. So it was made in the final five years before Edwin Fear died, and he signed the movement. The hallmark, the maker's mark, is EF for Edwin Fear. Well, I recently did, uh, so there's now the Fears Owners Club, 
which is open yes. to anyone who owns a Fears watch. It's free to join. And the oldest watch that a member owns is from 1850. Oh, wow. So wow. the members club isn't just for your new watches you sell. If you, if, you, if you have you know, vintage pieces that people have had. Exactly. Which must be fantastic for those people that have come into possession of those vintage pieces and they want to know a little bit of history as well. So, so uh, the thing is, you know, if you own your grandfather's watch or you own a you know, brand new Brunswick Midas, Mm -hmm. both join the club you both get the exclusive lapel pin you get you know there are different events there's different you know uh, promotions not promotions there's different things that take place that you know are worth joining for it's the idea of saying it is one company it just had this 40 year gap yeah. in 1946 so one year after the war ended uh, Fierce celebrated its centenary which is amazing. So, so the first hundred years are celebrated, you know, in the mid-century before 1950. It's like amazing. It's it? it's these little things when you think back and you go, when Fears started, it was a year after their GMT time existed for the railways. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so if you go if you go to Bristol, look at the um, the indoor market. It's I think it's Corn Exchange or the Town Hall. It's one of the main beautiful old buildings. The clock has two minute hands. They're 10 minutes apart. And one of them is Bristol time, and one of them is London time. That's it. Do you know what? <laughs> I, go, I go to Bristol quite a lot, and I have never put it to no. that. So next time yeah. I'm down there, 100% I've got to check that Don't out. Don't want to open your eyes, mate. How did you not notice that? Mm. You're into watches. If you're going to look at a clock, sure you noticed that there was enough I'll give you a football, <laughs> to be honest. So. I'll, <laughs> give you, I'll give you a tip. The best view is from the cocktail bar across the road. Oh, but that, oh what a good excuse. Yeah, the then, best way to look at it and see time double is with a dry martini. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, your, your job now is not only to develop the business and work out where you're going, it's actually to find the puzzle pieces as well as actually exactly. build that puzzle of the exactly. company. Exactly. I think, you know, That's what people have said to me, you know, oh, it's fantastic being a heritage brand and a heritage watch company, and I go, great. But let's actually look at it. Why does it matter? Like, why, why does it matter at all? And for me, the reason it matters is because, you know, when I'm developing something new, I'm thinking not just of, will this be successful this year or you know, next year? Or, you know, my business plan has five years, 10, 25, and 50. Because actually, both the second and third managing directors celebrated their half centenary working for the business. Oh. Well, that puts me in my 80s. So I'm kind of like, actually, this is a business that needs to outlive me. Yeah. You know, this is bigger than me. I'm sort of the custodian of affairs for the moment, having brought it back. But actually, you know, th th this isn't a business that when I pass away, will pass away. You know, yeah. I certainly touch wood, it won't. Like, you know, <laughs> the, the, that's the thing. You're sort of, you're thinking of building it and it's growing slowly because I'm not, there are a lot of new watch brands that are all about Fast growth, you know. Quick buck, and then and that's great, good for them. But you know what? Actually, it's nice that each year it is growing. But mm. I still, you know, I, I can still do a handwritten letter for everyone who buys a Fears watch. Um, so I understand you're uh, launching Fears Heritage. Um, so what's that about? So Fears Heritage, I'm launching at the end of this month. It's something I wanted to do from from the start. Mm -hmm. But it just wasn't practical with launching new watches. And yeah. The idea of Fierce Heritage is basically, it's a, a range of different services and products for all the watches that were made from 1846 to 1976. So all the watches in that 130 year period of the first incarnation of Fierce. And what we've been doing actually over the last year keeping it very quiet is we've been doing service work making straps and repairs on people's vintage fears watches mm -hmm. and you know the oldest watch we've been working on is from the 1900s and it's a pocket watch and we've actually had to make components from scratch for it making wheels it's making balance staffs because these parts don't exist no there's you know, no new old stock anymore this. and you know for one one watch there was a particular part we needed and it actually worked out better to buy an old movement from the same period, strip it down and use parts from it. The idea is saying that actually if you own any Fears watch, not only can you join the owners club, but we can also do an estimate for getting it serviced, repaired, and when it comes back to you, we can supply a document 
with all the information we have from the archive about the watch. Mm -hmm. So almost like a sort of extract from the archive, as people like to call it. But for us, it's just saying this is a fierce heritage document, saying this is you know what the watch is, when it was made, what's unusual about it. Which is great for Fears owners and also great for you as well because you'll be having these vintage pieces right. coming back and you can learn a bit more. And about you know, our, though we don't, we won't be sharing the photos. We will be we're professionally yeah. photographing every watch we to work archive on. them, right? Exactly. Yeah. Because then we've now got we're building up this sort of range and database of information about what was made. Um, but also, it's simple things like straps. We were talking about straps earlier today. You know. If you've got a Fears watch, say from the 40s, and it's got fixed spring bars. Yeah, I was looking like, at the one in there, actually, with the yeah, fixed spring bars, yeah. Yeah, fixed spring bars are quite common. You know, you have to buy a strap. It's all a bit fiddly. Whereas we're going, right, well, we will make a strap for you. And, you know, the choice is whatever you want from the Fears custom range. So, you know, 80,000 colours, different exotic materials. But actually, if you say, I just want like original, well, that's fine. We can hand make, hand sew onto the watch a strap as if it's from the original and of course you know we work with the tannery in Bristol who we used to work with in the 1920s oh wow so, so yeah. actually we can be we can make a strap out of leather from the same place that would have made the original one so it's offering that service of going actually let's treat these watches as we would treat someone who's bought a brand new Brunswick you know or Redcliffe you know it, it's saying actually any watch that has fears on the dial we're going to look after it. We can provide those service. That's yeah. incredible. It's, uh, yeah, it's just a massive benefit to you and the customer, I guess. It's, um, it, it kind yeah. of goes both ways, doesn't it? You know? And for me, this is what being a heritage watch brand is about. It's yeah. not about saying, we've got this great archive, so we're going to just take this watch, recreate it, because everyone loves vintage watches, and then just you know, put it out there and try and sell as many as we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's obvious. I don't like obvious. I don't. When someone goes, oh, this is how you should do it. It's like no, 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 no. Actually, I've always wanted to run fears with the belief: if the company kept going those forty years and hadn't got swallowed up in some, you know, some group or whatever, what would it be doing today? So it's things like you know, our packaging is always dark blue with a cream lining because that's what fears did in the thirties. The logo we use today is a logo used for three decades before. Mm -hmm. It's, it's that sort of, you know, mindset of thinking, well, what would my relatives have been doing? What, you know, what would they have created? And, you know, it's also paying respect to the heritage. I was exactly. going to say, it was, um, it, it's almost like looking at 30 years, like you say, what could have been in that place? But you're not, you're always paying homage to the previous ones, but you're not making replicas no. of them, of the no. vintage watches, which is, yeah, that's such a good way of doing it. I think that's fantastic. You know, you use design elements. You are like, oh, these numerals are similar to this. But this case is similar to this. But actually, the use of certain colours and certain shapes, you know, the logo, the Fierce Pipette logo, you know, that's an entirely new creation. And there's a whole, the reason it comes into existence is linked to the archive, but it's, it was a shape never used before 2016. And it was never created as a logo, in fact. 2016 started yes, up. Yep. Am I right in saying it was a year later, the first watch? Was no, um, so well, the company was incorporated at the end of 2014. 2014, sorry. And then I basically spent all of 2015 planning, doing research, and yeah, I was working every lunchtime, every evening, every yeah. weekend. You know, I was doing night school courses to learn Adobe Illustrator so I could do technical drawings and InDesign so I could do all my brochures and things. Um, and then it got to 2016 and I was like, right, I want to launch in 2016 because of the 170th anniversary. And I knew I wanted to launch a Salon QP, so I knew that was at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I basically need a good, clear six months to work full time. But also, bear in mind, like, you know, I'm putting all my money into this. I, there was a thing that every month longer I was at Rolex was another paycheck cash. Of course. Yeah. So it was kind of that finding that balance. And then it got to, um, it got to the start of 2016, I was like, right, end of February, I need to just make the break because March is Basel, I was going out there to meet with suppliers and I just needed to go out there not worrying about anything else in my brain, you know, you mm -hmm. need to go out focused. Um, so actually by the time I finished Rolex, I had sketches and rough technical drawings of the first watches ready to go, but I hadn't yet signed the contracts on who was going to make them, packaging, website, 
you know. Bear in mind, at this point, I'd never even used Instagram. So yeah. things like the social media was non-existent. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I kind of left with a, right, everyone, you'll find me on the 3rd of November at the show, launching the company. And it's weird, you need to put a stake in the ground, and if you tell everyone, then you have to do it. You have to do yeah. it. And that's when the, was that the first piece you launched yep. was the... Redcliffe date. That was the Redcliffe, so that was the quartz piece. Yes, right, yeah. quartz Swiss made. Okay. So it was something I really wanted the first watch that I launched to be something very different from the archive watches, like I explained earlier. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to go for something that was in the similar price to how Fears historically was. Okay. When you convert the pound, shilling and pence, Fears was always a sort of four to eight hundred pound watch brand in modern money. Now, sure. of course, inflation has changed that. that and, yeah. um, so I wanted it to be sort of around that. So 650 pounds, that was the price I wanted. I also wanted to make a watch that was something you just put on and forget, you know, you could wear it, you could dress it up, dress it down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, though not everyone loves quartz, quartz has some huge benefits. Um, and also when you're starting a watch, gra watch brand on sort of 30,000 pounds, <laughs> you know, there are things where you go actually to start making a mechanical watch and prototyping it is, I mean, I look back now and you're going like, oh, you know, so tomorrow I've got a, a prototype watch arriving from the workshops. And I'm looking at that watch and I'm like, yeah, that watch has cost 20 grand to make one watch, you know, yeah. that prototype. And I think back then, 20 grand was like yeah. all, my, all the money in the world. Um, without sounding too blasé about it nowadays, it's just as the business grows, mm -hmm. the amounts that scare you. <laughs> That's I would imagine that the context of being able to pull that off isn't something like something that you can just kind of open up the yellow pages or go on the internet and just be like, oh right, that's it, I've found everyone I need to do to no, make that. No, and, and a lot of people won't talk to you. Mm -hmm. So you turn up in Switzerland with your checkbook going, right, I want to place an order, I want to do this. They have to want to work with you. Oh. <laughs> and what was very good in 2016, the industry was beginning to slow. Mm -hmm. So when I'd been at Basel in 2015, a lot of the people weren't wanting to talk to me. 2016 they were, because I'm talking like, What's your minimum order? Okay, can we half it? Like really small orders. Suddenly they actually want that. They order. want the, they they want the order. It. They need it. Exactly. Um, and actually, that's then helped as the industry has also continued to be, you know, going down a bit. It's helped them with developing things like the Brunswick and the Mida. Suddenly, the orders, you, you know, the quantities can go even smaller. So. In a way, I've, I hate to say I've benefited from it, but it's you know it, yeah. it, it's allowed it to happen. But yeah, so this first watch, I knew what I wanted. I knew how it was going to be two dial colors, so there's a choice. Lots of different strap colors make the straps easy change because a big frustration of mine at Rolex was people would come in going like, oh, I, really, I want to get a strap for my watch, just mm -hmm. like your watch. You'd come mm -hmm. in, and we'd go, great, we can offer you calf, lizard, or alligator. Okay, cool, I'll go for one. Of them. What colors do you have? we can offer you black or brown, <laughs> that is it. And I was like, that's fine. You know, if you look at the statistics, 90% of watch straps are black, 8% yeah. are brown, 2% are other color. And why is that? Because they're the only colors offered. Available, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you look at my, my number one best strap is blue, mm -hmm. always blue. And if it's not, then people will buy the watch, say on a brown, and order a blue as the backup strap. So, yeah. it, you know, because blue works with everything. I mean, look, between mm -hmm. us, how many blues are we wearing? Yes. 40% <laughs> of men, it's their favorite color. You can put light blue with dark blue, they will go gray. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, if you had different shades of red, it doesn't work. Different shades of green doesn't always work. So I knew, you know, I, I knew I wanted easy change straps, range of colors. And so if we have a look at the red cliff. Oh, which one are you picking out? Ah, oh, one, one of the is. originals, yes. Um, which obviously we'll put B-roll on top, but absolutely stunning. Which is, this is your own shade of blue, isn't it? Yes, so this one is the Redcliffe date in Fears Blue. And the reason it's my, I call it Fears Blue is because it's between Pantone references. So okay. it, it's a shade of blue that changes in the light. It's actually made up of lots of different flecks of different blues. So in some lights, it's almost midnight, and then suddenly the sunshine will catch it and it goes teal. 
Yeah, yeah. You can see which that. You, which I'm noticing you quite a bit, see. just even in like this badly lit room. <laughs> so it's a 38 mil, right? That's what it is. 38, 38 mil, mil case, yes. Perfect size. Eight and a half millimeters thin. Mm -hmm. very so it's a thin. very slim watch, and then 20 mil lug width, which means you can put it either keep it on a fear strap or if you've got a collection of straps or NATOs, whatever you want to put it on, you can put it on. And then the hands and the hour markers are all super lumen over. So it's a very practical okay. watch. And actually, see with the date at free, it's got lumen over either side of the date window. Does it? Uh, okay, so on and the, um, on like the teardrop logo, that's, I don't know what you call it, a teardrop no, it's logo. Pet, the pet. It's the pipette. Pipette, sorry. Yes. I'll cut that. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, um, but with having it either side of the date window, it means that if you're using it as a bedside clock, you know at like three in the morning which way round you're holding the watch. Three if you've inside. got a date window, let's make a feature of it. You yeah. know, it helps draw your eye to what the date is. 100% um, without having to use a cyclops. Exactly. And then there's little details, like the counterweight on the second hand is a pipette. I was looking at this for ages earlier on and I hadn't noticed that at all. This. Between the words Redcliffe date, you'll probably also notice it says electronic oscillator, which is the formal way of saying it's quartz. 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 Mm -hmm. But then between the word electronic and oscillator is a tiny little lightning bolt. Yeah. As you say, what, what would the company have done if it was still going? And I think if yeah. the, the 70s... That is exactly the kind of thing that this well, company would have put it going straight into the courts. Yeah, so exactly. There. Mm -hmm. It's amazing legible as well. I think that's one of the things that like yeah. I said. It's um... and I, actually, this is a big thing of mine. I've always wanted a watch. You know, you glance, you can tell the time. Yes, yeah. that's the reason why you're wearing a watch. And I know we don't need to wear watches, so there is the practical argument is slightly less. However, you know what? Actually, yeah, you want to be able to look. And actually, if it's practical and legible, then that tends to really Result in a good design. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, there's the um, reference number, the BS one. The reference so. number, and also its unique serial number. Okay. So each watch has its own number, and so the numbering is by family. Mm -hmm. So I own Redcliffe and Brunswick number thirteen because I was born on Friday the thirteenth, so it's my lucky number. <laughs> yeah. And it avoids someone else having having a watch with thirteen on. <laughs> but it also <laughs> means that there will never be another watch with that number on. Mm -hmm. you know, there won't be another Brunswick which is fantastic version. so it helps with you know the history of the watch you know you actually it is a unique number no. actually because each watch comes with a service history logbook we're saying well look you know the case on that watch can be polished year after year after year and that's the thing you know, you can design a watch or make a watch to last sort of 40 50 years but it's all the things behind it you know I've invested a lot of money in spare parts spare components mm -hmm. so that actually you know, if you came to me in 2040 and said, right, I need a new minute hand and a new crown or a new bezel, mm -hmm. yeah, we've got those. Well, with the, the one little archive thing, which I did include on there, which resulted in the pipette, mm -hmm. is the shape of the hand are the same shape used by Fears in the 40s. Okay. So I really want to do that. Thing is, when you've got a hand that's very straight and goes to a little point, mm -hmm. what pattern do you put with it? Because if you put a block, like a Rolex, you know, sort of rectangle, yeah. it's a point going to a block, it sort of jars a bit. If you do a circle, then it's a diving watch. Yeah. If you do a triangle, then it's a bit quirky and unusual. Mm -hmm. So I ended up just using the same shape of hand Good. so that okay. it comes and matches. And then I made a bigger one for the date window. And then what happened was on an Instagram post, I think it was in December 2016, so a few months after I launched, it's a month after I launched, and I was putting when the company was, you know, last shipping dates and when the company was closing for Christmas. And I put up a post using the date window in the pipette. Yeah. In the January, I went for lunch with a, with a journalist and he said, oh, I love that shape you use. It's like your logo. It's almost like a pipette shape. And I was like, hmm, it is quite a distinctive shape. <laughs> so what I then started doing was putting it as like a watermark on pictures. Okay. And people were like, oh, I love that you're using your logo. It'd be great to see it like used in more places. And it then just naturally became... It's so organic the yeah. way it's grown. It's worth noting as well in the box, we've got a, we'll do some B-roll at the top. We've got the white one. Then we've yeah. got, I don't know what you call it. Is it a great Right, so let me, I, I'm, I'm like a Farrell and Bull catalogue. I get funny <laughs> names to everything. So, <laughs> so you're holding Fierce Blue. Fierce Blue. There's Jetliner White. Jetliner White. Pebble Grey. And Passport Red. Passport Red, I like that. 
I've Which, recently seen it with Passport Blue. I'm sure you have to change it, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My comeback to that is, well, the majority of the world's passports are red. Yeah, true. So, yeah, yeah. 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 But the watch that uses Passport Red is the next one on, isn't it, from... So, yeah, the Passport Red is on uh, the Redcliffe date, but it's also on the Continental. Oh, look at this. We didn't see the underneath of this. Which Nick's is, box of tricks. I know. <laughs> so this Continental has got a G, GMT function. GMT function. It's dual yes. time. Dual time, but without without the extra hand. Yes. So, so it has a dual time wheel instead. Exactly. So Very it's cool. just as having a date window is quicker and easier than having a date hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the same with a GMT. You know, if you want to know the time somewhere else, you just look at the window. You don't look for where the hand is on yeah. the dial. And we were discussing this this earlier on. So obviously this is a quartz movement, but this is a very special quartz movement. Right. So the movements in the Red Cliffs are made by Rhonda. Mm -hmm. And when I was designing the Continental, I knew I didn't want to just do a fourth hand. Yeah. I was like, right, I know I want to do this feature. So I contacted Rhonda and said, right, you've got a movement in your in your range. I'd like to purchase some of them yeah. and they said of course however there'll be a delay because we don't actually keep that movement in stock <laughs> because no one used it everyone uses the fourth hand yeah so they actually made a batch of movements just for fears just for the continental which is fantastic which really. just, yeah it makes it incredibly rare and so the reason the window that the second time zone is an oval mm -hmm. it's the exact same shape as the GB car sticker ah when okay. you drive abroad Ah, so it's just sense. a little subtle reference to that sort of like the 60s glamour of co you know continental Again, motoring holiday another Easter egg. Yeah. and the you'll see the two tone dial effect it's got like a sort of globe emblem Yeah, it's not the Pan Am globe it's the BOAC which became British Airways it's a globe they used in the 50s interesting that's fantastic it's just those things that you wouldn't although you've noticed that they're, they're, they're a detail and then there must be some reason behind it or well actually sometimes there isn't a reason behind sometimes it sometimes it's just like because I like it but you know, know with, <laughs> well, you know with fears that there's going to be a reason behind it so moving on from the Red Cliff we then move on to the Brunswick's so the Brunswick's how long was it until you you were operating after the say the Red Cliff came out you decide to uh, venture into mechanical? Well, interestingly, I'd always planned to do the Brunswick. I'd always planned to make a watch that was cushion cased because yeah. I had one from the archive from 1924 that was cushion cased. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I love that shape. It's so unusual. I want to do it. I really wanted to make it a sort of not fully British made because I knew that was unobtainable but I wanted it to be you know built in Britain and you know using a lot of components from here and I knew I wanted it to be a sort of a, a mechanical manual wind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The plan was to do it in five years so from when I launched that meant doing it in 2021, 2021 will be Fears' 175th anniversary so I was like that would be a really great watch to do for them. Sure. However I launched and pretty much on the day of launch a gentleman came up to me and said oh you know it's great like it'd be lovely to see a mechanical watch and I said yes it would be but it's going to take a while and he said okay well here's my card give me a call you know I might be able to help anyway so I gave him a call and we met up over the next like six months sort of regularly for cups of tea you know mm -hmm. turned into pots of tea because the meetings were so long <laughs> discussing how this could be done and finding a way of doing it that I could afford to do it because, you know, at this point I've spent all my money and yes, the sales were very good, but, you know, they weren't good enough really to suddenly go, right, we're going to completely change and do this. Anyway, in the end, it worked out that we could build a prototype. Mm -hmm. So I was like, right, you know what we're going to do? We're going to build the bro prototype and we're going to make 14 of them because fears used to be at number 14 Brunswick Square. Yeah. So we'll just make 14. See, everything everything, has, position, everything has a meaning. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought, you know what, let's just do this as like a one-off project. That mm -hmm. you know, everything is, is, is the Red Cliffs, but we'll do it as a one-off project. And then launched it at Salon QP 2017. Now, interestingly, I was showing you earlier the sketches of mm -hmm. getting the case design. So I did the sketches and then the 2D drawings and then someone else did the 3D drawings. And actually, the, all the shapes are exactly how I wanted them done. We built a prototype. Those sketches, the data I put on those sketches, 
think it was the 16th of June. This watch launched on the 2nd of November. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow, that's okay. a very, very quick prototype. And it was, the, the prototype was identical, was it? Pretty that's the prototype. Oh, and the, the prototype, yeah, exactly. The prototype is still oh. close enough that we can actually show it as a watch. Now, well, if you compare that to this, the finishing on this is exceptional compared yeah. to that. Yeah. Because that is a prototype. Exactly, yeah. But we only changed a few small things. The prototype, you know. Uh, it, it's, this will be a huge disaster in years to come because I was very lucky the prototype basically was right first time. <laughs> so I, I, I'm at the event, uh, I show the watch. We sold the 14 in the first month. Fantastic. And I was like, wow, that's amazing, that's incredible, you know. And then emails kept coming in going, I want to buy one, I want to buy one. And so I was like, okay, well, okay, well, we'll, we'll make a second batch. And those sold within, I think, another month. Suddenly you're just like, okay, maybe we need to actually turn this into like a proper production watch. But interestingly, this was the thing, the very first batch, I didn't really know how much it was going to cost to build. We built a prototype, which was extortionately expensive, but I was like, I'll just give it a price. Mm -hmm. So I priced it, I think it was like 1750. I was just like, I'll just call it a price and you know, yeah. it's only a one-off project, so it doesn't really, really matter. And the other day I was uh, going through my accounts and worked out actually how much each of those watches cost. I lost hundreds on every single watch. <laughs> Just and, don't go on Dragon's Den. Oh no. You sort of look back on it and you go... <laughs> it's a no from me, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> And it was just, you know, you look back on it and you go, but you know, at this point I've been running the business for a year. I had no idea how much this was going to cost. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that it would be so popular. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I did then have to, have to be realistic and put the price up. And actually, you know, the thing is, at the price it's now at, which for the steel one is 2850 it's nowhere near the, the markup you'd get if you bought... Sure. <laughs> yeah, if that was in a, if that was in most retailers, you'd probably be looking at four and a half grand. Mm -hmm. but, I, but what I'm, I, I like to think is that actually, if it was four and a half grand, you'd put it up against another four and a half grand watch and go, it's, it's yeah, comparable. It's comparable. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's the thing. It's going actually because we're selling them direct, but also because of the way I run the company, incredibly lean. You know, mm -hmm. we're sat here in the showroom, which is also my office. Mm -hmm. It's also the international headquarters. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's everything in one one small room, and the, and the money has gone into our face. I mean, you were showing me the packaging earlier on. It's we'll absolutely packaging. fantastic. Yeah. Of course, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll lay some beer over, but it's a very thought out packaging, and for the price, you wouldn't expect it to come no. with a watch at this price point. It's. Uh, it's, it's an event in itself, yeah. opening yeah. up the box, it's lovely, and there's loads of little details that all hark back to the heritage of the company, Definitely. which is just absolutely fantastic. And I think more watch, make, or watch companies need to do that. A, a watch box shouldn't just be some fake leveret piece of crap. It should have some kind of thought into it. That's what you're presenting your hard work and your company in. So make it count, and that's exactly what you've done. It's, it's an amazing there's, piece of care. If you think back to when you know, Fears was probably at its peak in the 40s, 50s, you know, to get a watch was such a big deal. You know, mm -hmm. you'd have one watch for life. And, mm -hmm. one, and the reason I think people love vintage watches, and you know, it's not just the aesthetic and the patina, it's also the knowledge that when you're holding that watch, that wasn't part of a collection. No. Yeah. That was someone's one watch. It's they your watch, wore, yeah. Good days, bad days, high days, holidays, they wore it all the time. And so much goes into that. And that's why classic watches were designed just to be very elegant and very understated, which is what Fears did and what yeah. I aim to do with things like the Brunswick. The idea is that actually it's an item you cherish. Stats, people like stats. So 20 mil again, lug. 20, 20 mil lugs, yes. Uh, lugs. Um, 38 by 38. 38 by 38. And it's got this amazing cushion case that... It, it, it serves it, no it, purpose other than no. for decadence. I well, mean, I love it that. It's like the cushion case doesn't 100%. serve a technical purpose, it, just an air. It's so thing. incredibly comfortable, and it feels so natural to have on the wrist. I think that's got to be you've something from that shape. But you've you've kind of pulled forward a vintage aesthetic, but put it into a modern package, a reliable yeah. package as yeah. well. Using yeah, I mean, it's an ETA ETA seven thousand and one. So you guys strip bullet. down. Yeah. So when we get them, we we strip it down, we service them, we do some decoration, but also because we make our own watch hands and we laser cut them out of steel, they're they're 
thicker than normal stamped yeah, hands. So, yeah. so we have to change the cannon pinion to make sure the hands, there's no way they're touching. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the thing. It's a double domed crystal. When you actually look, you need quite a lot of space between the top of the dial and the bottom yeah. of the glass to accommodate those hands because they are they are quite thick. But it just gives them such substance, you know. It really does. They and because really they're firmly blued, mm-hmm. you get them out in the sunlight. And, and they, they just pop. They're incredible. And it's, it's the way, my favourite bit about the watch actually is the way the crystal meets with the bezel. It's just such a clean line. Yeah. If you look at it at a slight angle from the edge, the way it all just flows. It, is yes. just, it doesn't Fantastic. just look like it's just sat on top. It, mm-hmm. it, it's no. purposely made that way. And it's, each um, of those crystals really is, is ground to fit in, you know, for, for the watch. So, you know, the bezel is a screw down mm-hmm. bezel, which no one really does these days. No. But for the way we construct the watch, it is that traditional way, you know, so it's a free part case. Um, but it also means you get the bezel is beautifully polished and then it sits on a spun case with polished yeah. sides and then the back has the same, you know, a spun case back but then with frosting, it's using all these different surface finishes. Mm-hmm. Suddenly you're like, wow, this just gives it... And I love the touch okay. of the pipette again on the back of the movie. Yeah, the golden well. pipette is very key because, you know, it's not a fierce movement. We're not no. gonna. I'm not gonna start trying to give it some fancy yeah, caliber number and try and persuade you guys that because we've made some you know changes and modifications that therefore it's a complete new. It's not a new <laughs> movement. We're but, talking about eulogies. <laughs> but the thing with the movement, it is a bulletproof movement. Yeah. It also means that if you are if you own that watch and you're the other side of the world and you need a service to regulate it, mm-hmm. a watch made that time. So yeah, hundred percent. Um, but because we have done work to it. It feels justified to put the golden papet on mm-hmm. as the sort Absolutely. of seal of saying, you know what, we've we've actually done enough to this to warrant this. And it's know? another lovely touch for again the owner who's invested the time, or the, the, the money into the watch that they can look and think, right, that's just another piece. The final one we are going to look at the is Brunswick Midas. Brunswick Midas, my absolute favourite. Such now, a fantastic. Watch. When it came to naming this watch, hmm. so this watch launched just after I'd done. Uh, the Fears six week pop up shop in London last year, and we had the final the final pre production watch come through, and we were like, right, got the watch ready to go. What do we call it? And I didn't want to call it the Brunswick Gold mm-hmm. because it's not solid gold. No, I wanted to give it a name to give it its you know its own identity, and we we're playing around with all kinds of different names. Uh, and, and so there were, there were a group of us in the shop and we were just throwing around different ideas and like, and I, I said, oh, it's got like the Midas touch, you know, it looks like it's been touched and turned into gold. <laughs> and it was one of those names where everyone laughed and was like, that's an awful name, you can't call it that. <laughs> and you know when you're sort of on the, you're on the cheap home and you're thinking, damn it, I'm gonna call it the Midas, yeah. like, I really <laughs> like that. I was so, really hoping you just named it after the song. Like you heard it on the way in before you named it and thought, actually, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> So it's exactly the same as Brunswick, other, other than the um, other than the overall finishing on the colour. Um, well, so it's got a few differences actually. Ah, so okay. The case isn't the base isn't steel. Okay. It's marine grade phosphor bronze. Wow! So it's actually a bronze case. That yeah. explains the weight difference, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there are say. several reasons why it's not a steel case. If you want to plate a steel case, you get lovely finish. Mm-hmm. But you could pretty much rub it off with your finger because stainless steel, as yeah. the name suggests, doesn't really want to react. Bronze, by its very nature, likes to patina, it likes to react. Yeah, so, it so if you it. coat bronze, it basically sucks it in and it, you get a stronger coating. But I, as you probably see, I don't know if it comes out on camera, I have very pinkish skin. Mm-hmm. So if I put yellow gold on it looks a bit brassy like sure. it just doesn't really see rose gold looks nice but rose gold is quite pink it's quite, nowadays it's very coppery and i was looking at one of the watches we've got in the archive and it's got a lovely one it's actually the one right behind your head it's got a very nice warm yellow gold mm-hmm. and it's a rolled gold case and the way that gold is patinaed and worn and i just love the warmth of it being a yellow but a warm yellow yeah so we started experimenting and said, well, what if we actually coated it with different carat weights and different colors of gold and just did different layers of gold? 
And what we in the end found was if we did a base of 18 karat rose gold and then a top coat of 9 karat yellow gold, you get that colour. It's so superb. No, it it's really is. It's amazing. So I, um, I was delivering a watch to someone mm -hmm. and, I, uh, and they get it out of the box and we looked at it. And I suddenly, when they were holding it, I was like, it looks, hang on, I put that in the box a few minutes ago and it looks a completely different colour now. And then suddenly realised we were in a bar and it was just the way the light was reflecting on it's it. It's fantastic. Yeah. And we do the same to the hands and also to the movement and to the crown. And to the movement as well, so that's placed so in the all, same way. They're all done in the same. So I've given it a, a term, dual gold, because it is two golds, you know, it's, it's two colours, it's two carat weights. It is a unique colour. And it is a colour that I don't think there's a skin tone it doesn't work with. So, yeah. you know, whether you've got sort of olivey skin, dark skin, light skin, whatever colour, the, the gold just looks lovely. And actually, because the dial is the same layout, it's not a just a batten dial or a black dial, it's not as dressy as you first think. You say, oh, it's a gold watch. People go, oh, it's a dress watch. And you're like, well, not really. Like, now you could wear this in a number of occasions. You dress it up, you dress it down. You, you were saying, to me, you were saying yeah. to me earlier, on actually off camera, that Fizz never had a dedicated tool watch or a dedicated dress no. watch. There was just no. the, the limbo in between that's actually turned into its own thing. It was just it's a watch. Um, it was yeah, just, just a watch. watch that and the, really this is watch. the, you know, if you want a cushion case watch, we've got the steel one or we've got the Midas one. And there is something quite nice about taking the gold watch back from always being seen as... Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. The Making it something watch. a lot more versatile. Yeah. So is there any uh, any future plans for like the next watches uh, in fears? Well, there is and there isn't. It's it's a thing of saying, well, you know, I've I've got a spreadsheet of watches I want to make up until the end of the twenty twenties. Oh wow! You know, having an idea because I'll be doing my morning job and suddenly be like, oh my goodness, we should make this. That'd be amazing. And you go right, okay, great. Let's look at the plan of what you want to launch because not only do I not have the funds to just launch everything in one go and develop it. I don't have the capacity to design lots of watches in one go. Mm -hmm. There's also a thing where actually I think watch companies should always look to do fewer, not more references. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, actually, if we if we did a Brunswick and we did a different dial, there's a song and dance about that because it's, you no, know, there's a lot of work to design a new dial. If I had the Midas and go, right, you know, do six dial colors or seven dial colors, that's great. We're only making five a year. Like, really... <laughs> You've got more options than you've been out there. <laughs> yeah, you sort of look at it and you go, actually, no, no, no. Like, you know, because of course, it's not just what you're offering new. It's mm -hmm. also to do with the after sales. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also to do with the fact, like, how many spare parts you're holding on. And spare parts so. are very expensive because they are stock, tied up with money, which of course, you yeah. hope will never be used but they may not be used for years down the line. And this is something I learned working for Rolex. You know, if someone's came in with their, you know, their 1960s day just, yeah, we've got dials, we've got hands, we, we've got the parts, we can, you know, rebuild the watch effectively. Yeah. So going back to your, your question, um, yeah, you know, I've got the long tail plan. I've also got plans of like what I'd like to launch next year. And I know how much money that will cost. So I know at what you know at certain points if i haven't got enough money in the bank well it will just get delayed at the moment we're building watches we're fulfilling the pre-order i think yeah you know, which is more important the way the way from everything that you mentioned from the design to completion to sales everything seems to be with fears it's just grown organically so there's yeah. no need to rush everything at all like right. you said you've got the 50-year plan yeah. i think what you're doing is absolutely fantastic i think i think the watches are really really incredible especially mm. the price point they're yeah. at I, I would rather, if you, if you bought that watch, I would rather you bought it and you loved it. Yeah. I don't want someone to buy a watch because they like it. Yeah. I want you to love it. And that also, the flip side of that is you may hate it. You may hate it, you may hate the company. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. But I'm not designing and building watches to try and make everyone yeah, happy. That's good. No. Because the moment you do that, you start thinking in a purely commercial sense. And if, if you make a watch, to please everyone, you're making a well, you're making an unremarkable watch. Exactly. And there's no point in that. Never design or do anything by committee. So yeah, thank you very much, Nick, no, for, well, uh, for inviting you. us down. We've really enjoyed ourselves down, right. absolutely thoroughly.
and uh, we wish you the best of luck. You definitely Thank deserve you. it. You've put a lot of effort into it, and it can be seen just by seeing the watches. And this is when it, you look straight into the camera, you can plug it now. You can plug it. You didn't it, get yeah. this on Scottish Watches podcast. You didn't get to look into a camera. <laughs> look into a camera and spy. It's very daunting. <laughs> into the camera well. So, where can we find you? Uh, so, you can find out more about Fears uh, at fearswatches.com or on Instagram, which is Fears Watches, mm -hmm. or Facebook, that's Fears Watches. It's so, basically, it's very easy to find you. Basically, if you just Google Fears Watches, something should come up but yeah fearswatch.com and then yeah crest a brochure send one out and everything's there, there you go. fantastic cool. so uh if you've liked the video please drop us a like and consider subscribing for plenty more content to come i've been anthony i'm luke and i've been nick and we're clock bait see ya bye, bye.